evening, folks. Tonight, our speaker is talking on a topic that should be uh, dear to all of us from the top of our heads to the very bottom of our feet. Uh, Steve Schaller has an extensive and varied uh, manufacturing management experience, a uh, record of improving operational financial results in a variety of industries. Um, he was telling me that his, his college degree is heavy in business, but it's also a technical degree on textiles. So he went from textiles into management of companies to now you're doing safety. Uh, he's been in the Atlanta area about 10 years. Grown children, at least. At least one. At least three. At least three. <laughs> Last time you it. Okay. And two grandchildren. Two grandchildren. Oh, no. And are they oh, going to be man. engineers? Uh, one of them will because his mother's from Georgia Tech. Ah. Right. Right, so. Um, nice quote here. Let's see. He sees safety as fundamental component of operating in business. <laughs> He's been the Atlanta Director of Operations for the Atlanta uh, in Atlanta for the National Safety Council for the past year. And uh, the mission of the uh, Safety Council is to eliminate preventable deaths at work, in homes, communities, on the roads, through leadership, research, education, and advocacy. Steve. Okay. Well, thank you, Roger, very much. You might want to hold your applause until after you see the presentation. So, uh, <laughs> get it now. <laughs> So uh, good evening. My name is uh, Steve Shaw, like uh, Roger said. Uh, I've been with, I'm a, the Director of Operations for the National Safety Council. I work out of an office right here in Norcross and talking to a few people. Most people don't know about the Safety Council. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. I've been with them now for 15 months. Uh, my role at the Council is to oversee all of the live safety training throughout the United States and Mexico. So if there's any safety training going on any day of the week, it runs through my office and I schedule it. I schedule the, uh, the adjusters or the adju instructors that will do the, the training uh, at, the at our facility here in Norcross, which you're all welcome to stop by and see. Uh, so I do, pardon me? Is that free service or is it fee-based? It's fee-based. Uh, also, I manage the uh, two NSC learning centers in the states of uh, Georgia and Alabama. So we actually have classrooms, one here in Norcross and one in Birmingham, Alabama, where we do do our training. So again, I'd like to thank Roger for uh, pestering me to do the presentation. Uh, he did a good job, a good sales job, and I'm glad to be with you tonight to give you an overview of the OSHA standards for PPE general uh, regulations. So, not, so this is a little bit of an advertisement now. I get five minutes to just talk to you a little bit about the Safety Council, right? So Roger already said this, but when we're asked, what do you do for a living, we've been kind of brainwashed to say our job is to save lives. That's what we do. And uh, as you can see, as Roger said, we do a lot of advocacies. You probably don't know that the Safety Council has, was involved in Click It or Ticket. It. It's also three seconds. Uh, right now, our new CEO is working on eliminating preventable deaths on the highway by in our lifetime. And she's working with a lot of the automotive uh, industry to do that. So there's a lot of uh, things that the Safety Council has been doing in the last year, year and a half, uh, that has really been in the forefront that changing safety in our lives. Yes, sir. Years ago, when I, it got in the state, at least in the Northeast, the NSC through its state section uh, offered a, the defense of driving course. Correct. Which was my first contact, but I guess in this area you're not involved with it directly? We do all the platforms. We have over 900 trainings in safety through the through National Safety Council. We don't do all those regularly, but if a customer would come to us and say, hey, we'd like to do something on a professional truck driver, we will, we can do those type of so things. You do it on a, here you do it on a client. <coughs> Not everything. We do we do schedule enrollment classes on a regular basis, but we also do. The, the one I was talking about was like on a Saturday, anybody who pays the money to do this, right. watches the movie, goes through the class, gets their certificate. Right. But it is a paid. It is it is paid out uh, for. It's not a free service. Right. I mean. Okay. All right. Very good. So the uh, let me go back here. So. Our, our vision is making the world safer, but again, CEO is talking more about eliminating 
preventable deaths in our lifetime. Uh, so the history of NSC, it's kind of interesting we're here with engineers because did you know the first safety council or uh, Congress that was done in 1912 was sponsored by uh, electrical engineers in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they got together because they wanted a body that could really take a look at pro uh, promoting health and safety in the industry. So in 1913, second Congress, they got together and they changed the name to the N National uh, Safety Council, but it wasn't, it wasn't the, for just industry. So they expanded their role to also cover traffic and, <coughs> and homes safety as well. Uh, we are we're a charitable, non-profit, non-governmental uh, organization. Uh, we are a membership uh, organization with over 55,000 members. So I do have some literature here for if you want to be a member for yourself or for your company. It, there's quite a bit that the National Safety Council would offer to you to, to keep you apprised of what's going on in training that is available, as well as regular weekly updates on OSHA information as well as other safety issues that are going on in the country. Uh, we have 24 chapters within our network throughout the country, and all those chapters will do in uh, classroom training with live instructors. We also go out to your own facility, and we will do training there as well as online. And we also provide the service of uh, consulting and safety services for over uh, 100 com uh, countries. So the the five initiatives that uh, NSC is working on uh, are really the ones that have the greatest potential to el eliminate preventable injuries and death. And they would include uh, workplace safety. Uh, prescription uh, medication uh, abuse is really, really big. I don't know if you know what's going on in that in the, out in the world today, but a lot of people are dying from overdosing uh, on abusing just regular over-the-counter uh, drugs. Also, teen driving and cell phones being used while driving, as well as home and safety, uh, or safety for home and in, in home and communities. Uh, one of the things in NSC, any employee in NSC is caught in an accident on their phone will be terminated immediately. So uh, that, that is something you sign up to when you, you come aboard that Distractive driving is a big, big component of where we are for injuries in in this country on the road. That even for or Everything you cannot distract. So a lot of studies have been done. I wasn't sold originally a year ago, but I'm sold now. That so, what's the difference between hands-free? What's the difference between a radio talking to somebody? There's a whole different dynamics that goes on when you're when you're talking on your cell phone. And anybody in this room knows if you talk to your cell phone, you don't know how you got to where you're going, but you got there, right? So that's happened to all of us. Uh, so that's the end of commercial. If you want to know any more about what the National Safety Council may be able to do for you, just go to nsc.org, uh, and you'll be able to find the information I think that you'll need there. So what's the objectives for tonight? So objective was to take a look at PPEs from, from head to toe and take a look at uh, we're going to take a look at doing a hazard assessment. What does it take assessment in order to be able to select PPEs? Understand the differences between the PPEs and how they can be used to uh, protect you, as well as the uh, proper wearing and caring for your PPEs, which is extremely important to make sure that you keep everything in good shape. Also, Roger asked me to take a look at updates, and I'm not an OSHA expert, but I did a lot of research over the last six weeks and found out there hasn't been a lot of changes in OSHA. And it's a very slow moving uh, system. But I did find out that next year they're talking about making some changes into the protective equipment. But we'll see now. Now the question is, with the new administration, what's going to happen? Will that, will that be slowed down or will it be something that we would uh, speed up? So what is a PPE? So a PPE is any clothing, any device, that is a barrier that's created between you, the employee, and, and, the, uh, oops, and the work hazard. Um, all PPEs should be safely constructed and should fit comfortably to encourage people to wear them. And I've been in the industry for a long time and to constantly have to go out and tell people about wearing their safety glasses because they don't want to put them on or they're uncomfortable or some of your prescription glasses has to put the other safety glasses over top of them. But if we don't make it comfortable and easy for them to use, it could make the difference between the employee being safe 
we're definitely be dangerously exposed. So PPEs, as we'll see as we move along, are your last line of defense. It's not what you should start out with. It's, and as engineers, we should start out with engineering solutions. But we want to use PPEs as the last line to reduce the hazards in the workplace. So I guess we all believe that all workers have a right to a safe workplace. And there's also the law that we have it. But I think to my managers, I would tell them that we have a moral obligation that our employees can come to work and feel safe and go home with all their digits. They might be tired, but they should get home with their sight and they should get home with their, all their digits. Uh, pardon me? Absolutely, absolutely. So if PPEs are decided that you have to use PPEs, you need to put a program in that will take a look at the selection of it, the maintenance of it, and a proper training. So what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening will be protection for eyes and face, head, arms, feet, torso, hearing, and respiratory uh, parts of our, of our body. So before we begin, just a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Previously, uh, I went to uh, 16 or 20 hours of training on OSHA. And they gave me a car for the last 10 years. Do you have something like that? Well, it depends. There's so many different things that OSHA has on OSHA compliance. So, yeah, Georgia Tech is, a, is an OSHA Ed Center. And if you is that what your question is? Asking? No, I had it from my company. They brought the presentation of the people for motion. Right. So. I mean, the National Safety Council does uh, OSHA, and we are hooked with OSHA Ed Centers in Illinois, where our headquarters is. And we do do training here, but Georgia Tech does such a good job that we don't try to compete with Georgia Tech doing the OSHA training. So, so start out, see how much you know about uh, protective equipment. Hazardous assessments are conducted only on job functions that involve haz hazardous materials. True or false? Absolutely. So I knew I wasn't going to get that past this group. So. Uh, but basically, it's expected that you'll take a look at every job function in every department in your organization when you do your assessment. Employers are responsible for selecting PPEs. True or false? It is true. Because OSHA feels that if the employer is responsible, that there's a better chance they'll comply with it than if you leave it up. And the employer has more information and data to make sure that they get the proper PPEs for their <coughs> employees. So that is true. Uh, PPEs should be inspected before each use. It makes a lot of sense. And we'll go through that and talk about that a little bit tonight or why that's important. But if you don't have a clean, if you're not, if you're, PPEs are not clean. You won't be able to inspect them, make sure there's not tears or not damage or cracks in them. And the last one is not important to keep PPEs clean. Very good. All right. Excellent. So, is anybody familiar with the hierarchy of controls as engineers? Have you seen this? Have you seen the, the, the safety model triangle? They're all kind of, they're all components that help us eliminate or reduce uh, injuries in our workplace. So, ideally, you want to be able to design out hazards when you start a new process. But how many of you have the chance of being involved in a new process? Not very often. We usually inherit the process that we walk into. But if you can, uh, cannot just do it at the beginning of the phase, there's three methods of trying to control hazards. And those three are engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPEs. And it goes from the least effective of PPEs up to the most effective. So when you're looking at engineering controls, you're looking at elimination and substitution as well. So you can just imagine, you want to physically remove a hazard, if you can, out of the system. And that would be like taking an old piece of equipment out, removing it, it's no longer a hazard. You could substitute the hazard. So maybe you have a hazardous chemical or a cleaning chemical that's hazardous. Could you substitute it with something that has less risk? And then in controlling, other steps, can you, uh, can you isolate the workers or can you keep the, uh, uh, the hazard from uh, being so pronounced? And that could be through guarding. You could put guards on a machine that would protect the employees. And then if, if, after you exhaust all those, you've moved down to administrative and it's the way people work. So it's how you schedule your people for work. Can you rotate people out, especially noise levels or hazardous material? Rotate them out so they're not exposed for a full eight hours or in today's world. Uh, it's 12. So most of the standards on uh, time weighted averages are based on eight hours. 
but really most people are working 12 hour shifts anymore today in the manufacturing. So there is a calculation for that. So protective equipment is once you decide that you're down to that level to protect the employees from hazards, uh, then you need to pick the appropriate equipment for them to use. Where would lockout tagout fall? Where would lockout tagout fall? Well, it, well, I don't know if it'd be administrative or engineering. I'm not sure. Combination. Yeah. So I think as an engineer, you're taking a look before you get to administrative. I would hope as engineers we would say we want to lock out this machine before we push it down. But the procedure and steps that are designed by the engineer, right? Supported by the administration, allows you to do it. Right. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, so hazard assessment. So. Uh, hazard assessments are just essential to understanding what type of hazards were presented to our people. And uh, it's, it's the law from OSHA that before you supply any PPEs to your employees that you should do a hazard assessment. So walking through a hazard assessment, you want to evaluate each job function in each department to identify the potential hazard. Uh, you want to determine the hazards. Are pre if the hazards are present, then you need to record those hazards, what they are, and get them recorded. Uh, check the hazard to, uh, for all parts of the body. So you want to make sure that uh, it's not just eyes that maybe uh, the hazard is presented. It could be for hearing. It could be for uh, foot protection as well. And then determine the appropriate uh, PPE that you should use based on the hazard that's presented. So we'll start out with uh, eyes and uh, and face. So basically flying, you want to you want to look at your check your operation for flying particles. Flying particles or, o or objects are ones that cause most of the eye and face damage uh, in the workplace. Uh, I'm sorry, I must be keep on. Excuse me. Molten metals, so it could be a hazard if your people are exposed to metal, which could splash up onto or damage their eyes or burn their face. And then hazardous liquids are also uh, very hazardous to the to the face and could be spray paint, it could be uh, all kinds of solvent cleaners, and they could also sp splash up or spray into the eyes of the of uh, your employees. So other eye areas uh, or would be acids, acids and caustic liquids that would be very serious damage to the eyes if it was spilled into the eyes. So some of those could be etching, acids used in etching or caustics used in cleaning solvents. Uh, ammonia. Uh, it would be a gas or a vapor that could cause uh, serious damage to your eyes. And then you also want to take a look at light radiation. So light radiation would be usually around like welding or laser operations where you have bright light is to make sure that people don't look directly into that operation without having uh, the appropriate uh, protection. By the way, there's a lot of light radiation concerns in fiber optics and communication okay. that's not visible light. Hmm. So people got to watch for that as well. Watch for the signs, even if you don't see the light. Okay, very good. Right, well, very good. So moving on to respiratory protection. So you want to take a look for potential inhalation issues that may be in your organization, like flying, uh, flying dust. Uh, also, you take a look at inhalation with vapors and fumes. There's a wide variety of different hazardous materials out there that could present themselves as a hazard to your employees. And then the lack of adequate oxygen. So there's many jobs that would have a confined space that you want to make sure that uh, there's enough, ox you know, enough oxygen for them to, to go and work in there without using respiratory uh, protection. If there isn't enough oxygen, then you would have to outfit them with a respirator. So after uh, you've done identify your potential hazards, you want to identify the source of the respiratory hazard, uh, then review the, the work process to determine where the exposure exists and the magnitude of the exposure. And then finally, uh, necessary, monitor the exposure to measure the degree of the hazard. So hearing protection, where most of us know, most industries you work in have hearing protection today. But the only way you really know if you're having that hearing protection is to really do a noise survey. And noise survey will really isolate the parts of your facility, the employees that are affected, uh, and where the noise, heavy noise level is. Uh, once you 
have identified that, you need to monitor that. And so there's devices out there that you can monitor to see what level your employees are exposed to. Employees move around the facility quite a bit, so as they're moving from one place to another, uh, there's meters out there that will determine what levels and average it out for you to tell the decibels that they're exposed to. And then you need to repeat that. The only time you would repeat it is if there's a change in your production or your process or if your uh, equipment uh, is influencing the noise level as well, either adding or subtracting from that. So head hazards. So head hazards are uh, caused by falling objects. And that happens where if you're exposed in a working environment where there's scaffolding or catwalks where people could be dropping uh, objects onto your head. Uh, so they're all coming up at the same time, aren't they? OK. Exposed, uh, exposed electrical uh, conduit is where it's required for hard hats. And those that do not con conduct electricity would be used. And then low high hanging obstructions where uh, you'd be walking around uh, low hanging pipes or structures. Or if you're working around uh, machinery, cleaning machinery that uh, you might bump your head, so it's a protection that you could use. So foot hazards, so we know people walk around with uh, carrying heavy objects and rolling materials that could roll across your feet and cause, uh, crush your feet and cause uh, damage to the bones of your feet. Uh, electrical hazards, you might be in an area and be exposed to where you need to wear isolated uh, work boots to protect you from the hazard. and. Uh, Slippery floors. Slippery floors are, you know, would be definitely rated as a foot hazard. Even though if you fell, you might not hurt your foot, but that's where the protection to reduce the hazard would be in footwear. So that's why it's uh, it is, uh, characterized as a, a foot hazard. Hazard materials, certain footwear that you would have to wear to make sure that if you spill chemicals on your into your body, your feet would be protected, as well as uh, cold weather conditions. So people work in cold weather climates, and they might use that, especially if there's a, a chance of possibility of being frostbit. So hand, hand uh, hazard assessment. Uh, so hands absorb materials. And as where most of our absorption comes through is our hands. And it can cause a lot of skin damage and, and, and issues. Uh, Severe cuts and lacerations could be caused in your operation because of machinery or equipment, and sharp objects that you use. Even hand tools can puncture uh, people's hands. And then severe abrasions uh, could be caused by working around grinders or sanders, rotating shafts, or just handling, handling glass. Other hand uh, issues would be uh, puncture wounds, hazards that you would have, and basically a wide variety of tools and equipment that we work around, like drills, nail guns, and even screwdrivers. How many of us have stabbed ourselves with our own screwdriver? So uh, burns, chemical burns, uh, can be caused by handling acids or caustics in your in work environment. And depending on the concentration of that caustic or the, uh, the corrosive, it could cause serious burns. And then thermal burns. Uh, in, your, in your organization or all, all around us, hot pipes, equipment that we're running, and so forth. That, uh, but, you know, welding is one area that I worked in for making propane tanks. And we always were having people getting burned by working around their welding equipment. Uh, and then finally, uh, frostbite. So you could get, you could get frost, frostbite if you're working in cold climates, or you could be working around cryogenic materials as well that could cause the same issue. So closing assessment is our last one of our uh, looking at torso, uh, hot and cold materials or objects. So you could work around steam pipes, which would be very hot. Or you could work in refrigerated facilities, be cold. So you want to wear uh, equipment to protect you against that. Hazardous materials, you'd be working around that would cause uh, uh, materials to splash on you. And you want to have some kind of protective equ uh, equipment for that. Welding hazards uh, would be fire-resistant clothing that you would want to be using to protect you against burns uh, from the sparks. Heavy, sharp, or rough materials. So 
when you're working around equipment, there's always going to be some type of a sharp edges on machinery or parts that you're moving. And uh, you want to have protective uh, clothing to protect you from uh, the cuts of your body, your arms, and your, and your legs. And finally, uh, moving equipment, which is where I see most injuries in manufacturing, where people get way too close to equipment and do things that uh, they shouldn't be doing. And uh, unfortunately, I saw a man stick his hand in a machine and lose all five fingers on his hand. And uh, you, just, you just cannot allow yourself to be that close to the moving uh, parts of a, a machinery. So loose clothing could be an issue. We all know not wear any kind of chains or bracelets around moving equipment because it could pull you in uh, equipment. So I don't know, in our younger, in our, in our younger years, how many of us ever received the proper training we needed. <coughs> But part of the expectation from OSHA is that you train your employees. And I look at this gentleman, it looks like I don't really think you have my best interest in mind. Uh, <laughs> so the, tr the training on uh, PPEs really needs to take a look at one, when and what PPEs are necessary. And I can tell you, even being a manufacturer, when I look back over the years, the fact that we didn't train people effectively, <clears throat> just throw people out there, even how to insert earplugs. One of the things that I've worked with gentlemen when I was a young man that didn't have their hearing anymore because they've been in manufacturing without all this type of protection. And uh, I've always tried to make sure that I would always wear my protection, not only at, at work, but at home when I was cutting the lawn. The lawnmower will also give you, will cause you ear loss if you don't protect yourself against that. But we also need to make them understand that there are limitations to PPEs, that they can't protect you from everything. And if the PPEs are not in good shape, that you need to dispose of those PPEs and get new ones. So the effectiveness of training, again, is the expectation from OSHA is that you're, all your employees are trained on how to use the PPEs, know about the maintenance of them, know how to check them to make sure if there's any damage, and that there are times that you might need to do retraining, and that is if there's a change in the work environment, if there's a change in the uh, PPE that you're requiring them, but most of all, I would say if you look at it, employees, and I can tell you in my, my own experience, I don't want to tell you again to put your earplugs in. I don't want to tell you again to put your glasses on. And if you don't put some teeth behind that, they'll continue to do that. But to go ahead and put them through training to make sure that they really understand how important that is. I saw a, I saw a guy lose his eye from a loom. The needle broke off and went into his eye. We did not require eye protection back in 79. You can bet the next day eye protection was in place. So uh, you can't take for granted that you're working around machinery, seeing people pick envelopes out of machinery that they were told never to do that, and they get their arm pulled in there. And we know they do that, so we all ha we have procedures how to back them out, you know. And we would tell people that you know that's the first time you kept your arm. Luckily, nobody lost their arm from doing that. But if it happens again, you're going to be terminated. I worked for Avery Dennison, and we were so strict on our safety policy and did very good training. People were told if you were injured on the job, you did something unsafe, you'd be terminated on the spot. And we would deal with all the workers' comp and all that type of stuff. But that's how serious it, it has to be in order to get people to follow wearing proper PPEs. So, pardon me? That's right. That's right. So here's just a little bit of fun. Uh, where good PPEs will not over, overcome poor work performance. And uh, so you can see the guy on the left is holding the rod with a guy above him with a sledgehammer, 12-pound sledgehammer. So uh, do you think that a hard hat would protect this individual? Absolutely no. Yeah. So th these are real pictures, too, by the way. These were in stage. So uh, it's, just a, it's just a poor work practice. So over on the right-hand side is you see a pallet. The gate's not closed, so somebody could push another pallet that could come off the mezzanine. And at seven, 700 pounds, 15 feet in the air, and the plant manager was asked about it, and he said the hazard was abated because his employees were wearing hard hats. So any thoughts on that? So that's not going to work. So even if no hazards are required in PPE, I still would emphasize to you to make sure that you have your written certification. Because there'd be a lot, it could be severe filing against you if they come in and find out that you have not done your PPE 
uh, assessment. So if an OSHA compliance officer knocks on your door, you should have this ready for them, even though you don't have to use any PPEs. So here's one of those, uh, what are the regulations changing? Uh, so in 2008, OSHA's rule changed. That's probably the most recent one I can find, maybe 2009, uh, where it requires the employer to pay for PPEs. But there are exceptions to the rules. They don't have to pay for all PPEs. Uh, but for the standard PPEs, if you require someone to wear insulated work boots, you need to pay for them. If somebody wears work boots to, to plant even steel toe, if you don't require it, you don't have to, the employer does not have to pay for it. But here's some of the exceptions. Non-specialty uh, safety shoes and non-specialty prescriptions. So basically, again, if someone has prescription glasses, you don't have to pay for those. If you put them in a respirator and they need to be put into the mask, the lens needs to be put in, that's required specialty equipment. The company has to pay for the PPE. So the other exceptions, and this one kind of caught me off guard. This is actually in the regulation that everyday clothes do not have to be paid for. So I thought that was a little, a little funny when I first saw it, that you would expect people that you would expect to be paid for your everyday clothes. Yes, sir. But you also have to specify not just long sleeve, but where you work around fire, it has to be non-polyester. So you don't want the stuff melting including the underwear. We try to emphasize that, you know, that that's a daily clothing that you're wearing, but you can't check that all the time. Right. <laughs> well hopefully we'd have some they don't want to have the problem and they're having parts. Right. I did have one time where an employee wanted us to pay for their sunglasses and put it on expense report, but that was that didn't, that, yeah. Pardon me? <laughs> there are some that like just standard long sleeve shirts are required in certain city situations. So I think that's why they. Yeah, it has to be specified. But ordinary clothes that you would normally just wear to work is not going to be is not paid for. And then lift belts. It's, lift belts have always been, you know, kind of a quandary to me as I take a look at. I had one myself, and I think that it does help when I'm lifting that I could use that belt. I haven't used it in years. But if you go through a Home Depot or Lowe's, you see that they have the, the belts, but they're always undone when they're not doing any lifting because it can weaken your, your muscles if you continually keep those, those on. But I just thought that, I just put that in there, that it is questionable if they do help, even though some companies do supply them. It's not something that OSHA would require you to, do, uh, to pay for. The other thing is that uh, if an employee intentionally damages or destroys the PPE, you're not required to pay for that <coughs> PPE either. So a standard overview, in case you want to do any deep, deeper dives and to take a look at this, you just go to OSHA.org. You can find out almost anything you want, more than you want to. Uh, but we're, we're talking about noise levels, talking about eyes, which would be 1910. So protective equipment is all under uh, the uh, Code of Federal regula Regulations of 1910. So you have 0.133 for face, you have 135 for head protection, 136 for foot, 138 for, for hands, and, uh, and that does it. I'm sorry? Oh, shit, what did I say? Okay, sorry, thank you. So again, now we're moving on to selecting uh, the eyewear as opposed to making assessments. So we already made the assessment. So now we're going to select what eyewear we need for the different hazards. So uh, safety glasses, see it's not showing, the, that's a shame. We have some pretty good pictures to go along with that. But uh, each one of those should be a different slide. Yeah, but each one of these would go from safety glasses to goggles to face you. Version differences between. Um, That'd be a, a common source for contact dermatitis. Pardon me. That'd be a, con a common source for contact dermatitis. Yes. Yes. So hospital workers working with latex gloves. As far as being paid for, is that? No, no, no. As in terms of a category of PPE for the hand. 
Oh, right. That'd be another consideration. Right. Well, there's 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 several categories we're not going to cover on electrical safety <laughs> as well. So there's just in the time interest that we had, just to go through the most common ones. Thank you. So safety glasses. What would come up here would just be showing you somebody wearing safety glasses. So with side shields would really be uh, used, and you would make your assessment if it was somebody to be protected against uh, flying objects, such as metal or wood chips. Uh, goggles would be used for the same thing, but also to protect you against uh, uh, floating dust, hazardous liquids, gases and vapors. Uh, face shields, different types of face shields that are out there, you need to make sure you select the right one. So it's really to specifically to keep splashes from getting into your face. Uh, shaded lenses, so you know with a welder cap you have lenses, but there are also glasses out there. So anytime you're, you're exposed or a potential hazard for uh, light radiation, that you want to make sure that you're using the pro proper uh, eyeglass wear for that. Uh, and then just prescription eyewear. So if you need uh, corrective lenses uh, for that, uh, you want to make sure that all of these uh, eyewears have the ANSI uh, Z87. So if you could go into a Home Depot or go into a Lowe's, you could find glasses in there that do not meet this code. So just because somebody like one of those two big box stores are selling safety glasses, they may not meet, meet the code. It might just be eye protection that they're giving you, but it's not within the OSHA code. There it is. Hey. Okay. I just went through them all. Okay. So wearing and carrying. So now we're into wearing and carrying of uh, your eye protection. So it should fit comfortably. So eye protection shouldn't pitch your nose. Have people say these aren't, you know, just, you know, from just the irregular glasses, could press, have pressure on the side of your head, doesn't fit around your ears properly. So they should fit comfortably. Uh, if they don't fit comfortably, then you need to change. Uh, they should not distort or block your vision. So some glasses fit better on some people than others. And if you start to get dizzy, or get headaches from wearing safety glasses, you should actually change the brand, see if something else would be better for you to use. Uh, put on before exposure. How many times have you seen someone go out into a hazardous area without having their PPEs on? And there's a lot of injuries that are caused because people wait till they get to the area that's hazardous to put on their PPE. So you want to remember to always put them on beforehand where you could have serious injury. You have, you have the PPE, you know you're supposed to use it, but you don't use it at the pr appropriate time. Yes, sir. May I ask a question? My question is to face for the prescription glasses. Correct. Right. Are they obligated or not? The company is not obligated to get prescript pay for prescription glasses unless they put you require it like in a respirator where you can't wear glasses to have the proper seal that they would have to put lenses in. Then they would pay for the prescription glasses. But other than that, does anybody have know of anything different than that? OK, very good. I think some companies go that, go that extra step, though. Right. Well, most companies they'll do you, right. You know, they'll give you a, an option to get prescription yeah. safety glasses right. so you don't have to wear the over right. glasses. I've worked for some pretty big companies. And most of the time, there's a stipend for work shoes or for glasses that they'll give you. And that's up to the company to decide. But it's not regulated by OSHA that you have to get those. You want to keep your glasses cleaned. And soap and water, there's also different wipes out there that we all know about to clean them. But they should be cleaned regularly, uh, sometimes more than just once a day. And then if you find out that you have scratches on your glasses, or if they've been damaged in some way that they don't fit appropriate, they're probably not giving you the protection you need. You need to dispose of those glasses and get new glasses. So moving on to respiratory protection, selecting that. So there's very different ones. I'm sorry the pictures aren't showing up for you, but <laughs> dust mask, purifier. OK. So the dust mask, we all know about dust masks. And people, we see them in airports. People are wearing dust masks that aren't required by law. And in companies, a lot of people may request because of inhalation of just dust in the environment that they'd like to have that. But there is a limit that is, that's called the, uh, what is it called? It's a permissible exposure limit. So if you're in an environment that would exceed that, and it's not vapors and fumes, 
that you could be required to wear a just a dust mask to protect you against that. Uh, the other one is the air purifying uh, respirator, which is the most common used respirator. You can get full face or you can get half face. This is a, a half face one. Uh, they have cartridges or filters that purify the air that you're uh, that you're breathing, and uh, it really does provide protection against fumes and and vapors. <coughs> So there's two others, the air supplied respirator, which is really around paint booths. And then the last one is on, the, on this breathing, but an air supply respirator would be where there's, there's a concentration, a high concentration of a hazardous material, or we're just working in an area that just doesn't provide enough oxygen like a confined space that you would, you would use an air supplied respirator. Uh, the breathing apparatus is used when you have immediate danger to life and uh, health like these um, doing a, it's a chemical spill. So these are responders that are trying to uh, take care of the chemical spill. Uh, all respirators need to be approved by NASHA, approved. Uh, so the wear respirator, uh, you have to have medical approval. So I've never been, I've never been around respirators or where they need it to be used, but Basically, there's a questionnaire that you fill out, and it has to go to a health professional, and they take a look at it. If it kind of meets those standards, then you could be fitted. You might be fitted with one. If not, it might have to go into a full physical to be able to make sure that you're capable of being put into a respirator. So you want to conduct a fit test when you get the respirator if you're going to be fitted in one, and that should be done annually. But every day that you put it on, you should make sure that it fits that properly to your to your face. And inspect the respirator before each use. The seal, you want to take a look at the strapping, make sure it's not worn or braided, uh, as well as uh, take a look at the cartridges, make sure they're not cracked or worn. Uh, if they are, then you need to make sure that you, you destroy and uh, get new, new parts, just, uh, discard and replace. Now, a lot of that, like on the medical, a lot of that was like your pulmonary function test right. to make sure you know, you can handle that type of thing. And the fit test, this is where it always, you know, the facial hair thing right. and, you know, different, there's actually different sizes. They have to get you to, in the right size, they'll actually snug fit, you know, so right. you don't have any leaking in between your right. nose and your eyes. One of the things I, I learned by looking at the History Channel, do you know why Hitler had such a small mustache? Because in World War I is when gas came out and they're gassing the, the troops and the gas mask didn't fit, didn't seal properly. So he learned, and that's that's where he, why his mustache is so small, is because of his experience in World War One. So now you have information you didn't have before. So useless information. We'll use that. Yeah. 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 Yes, they do. And, and there's also the manufacturers will give you all kinds of what the life is expected of that. But I guess it. Can we hear what the question was? He said, "Is there expir expiration date on filters or cartridges?" And the answer was, "Yes, there is." Is that answer are you good? Yes. Okay. So. We require our people to be clean shaven also to make sure they have good seal. Is that pretty universal? I don't. I could not find that in the regulations, but uh, I think it is. I mean, you can't get a proper seal with a beard. I don't you, think. You can get past that if you do a fit test. And when you do a fit test, you're using chemicals that are isolating, right. deteriorating. And well, my my beard's fine, fine. Put that can on his nose and watch his eyes water. Go, go shave. Does he have a beard for religious reasons? Well, you know, that's a problem with PPE. It's either going to fit or it's not. Good, thank you. So for 
wear and care of respirators, uh, you need to uh, check the seal on your face. Again, make sure that it fits properly to your face. Clean regularly. Uh, basically, uh, my understanding is clean them off with alcohol on like a daily basis, but periodically you need to completely take, take, break it down and clean it with soap and water and let it air dry out. And one of the other uh, areas for storing properly, to make sure you keep it free from dust and contaminants, you want to put it in a plastic bag. But you want to make sure the plastic, I used to make plastic bags, uh, the, the uh, Ziploc bags, and you want to make sure the bag is big enough because if you don't, you could distort the shape of the, the natural shape. So you want to make sure you don't stick it in somewhere where it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it destroys the shape of the, uh, of the mask. So ear protection. So there's many, many types of ear protection, and all of us have probably worn ear protection one time or another. And a lot of them are quite similar. Uh, to, to bring this up, so you have, the, you have basically, you have the foamies, you have the canal ones, and you have ear muffs we discussed today. But uh, earplugs are a really good way to reduce noise level out in a facility. And uh, I think the biggest thing with earplugs is that uh, once you put them in, you put them in properly, you can't really hear anything. So if you're out on a production floor trying to talk to somebody, it, it really doesn't work very well. Uh, the other thing is where you see these mechanics with dirty hands taking their earplugs and rolling them up, sticking their ear. It's just like, ah. So there's different types of plugs you can use. I always found the foamies to be the best that I, that for me personally, but they may not be the cleanest. Uh, canal caps are used by people who don't, are really are, are, are only exposed to loud noises for a short time. So like maybe a warehouse guy going through or a supervisor going through a, an area with high noise would use that because they don't really seal off in the, in the canal of your ear. Let's see if we can get it back. It's the second one that's going to pop up. Right there. Okay. So, uh, and ear muffs, ear muffs are usually used as supplemental uh, to earplugs. So if you can't reduce the noise enough, people might have earplugs in and use ear muffs. If your level isn't that high, some people like to wear the ear muffs. But I've also seen people who wear ear muffs because they said they're more comfortable for them, but it didn't reduce the noise level. So you have to be careful. Right. And they're rated, so it has to have a noise uh, reduction rate and all PPEs or all ear protection will have that. You just need to make sure that it gets down within the limits uh, so that you're... Pardon me? Hearing aid, right. Very good. And you can double them up too. I do that frequently. What do you I'll mean? The, the ear plugs. Right, and, and then the muffs over top. Right, of right, right. And that's what they're usually, most of the time, they're used for is to, to be dead in the noise even more. So here's... Here's some action levels from OSHA. Uh, most industry, I've been in several different industries. Most of them at 85 decibels will start supplying employees with ear protection. It's not required. It's required that you have a program in place uh, that you start, you measure, you go ahead and do the noise level, you let employees know about where the noise levels are, uh, and do your annual autograms, uh, and do some training. But when you reach 90 decibels is when you have to make sure that you're supplying at no cost to employees ear protection. But I can't even imagine somebody going without ear protection at 85 after, it's not that bad, but if you're in there eight hours and you're, listen, 85 decibels, which I think is about what a lawnmower is, is, is that right? 85 decibels, that uh, I can't imagine listening to that for eight hours. Okay, so selecting hard hats. Uh, So they all came up. Uh, so hard hats are really used to protect against uh, falling objects or penetration, so impact or penetration uh, of your head. Uh, we have electrical uh, insulated hard hats that are out there. So if you're around high power lines or electricity, don't assume that just because it doesn't have metal in it that it's, you're not going to have a problem with uh, the hard hat uh, protecting you against high voltage. Uh, bump hats. Uh, Again, we talked a little bit about being around low, low metal structure or piping, or if you're in cleaning machinery and you're just banging your head, it's just another protection for your head is to use the, uh, the bump cap. And uh, all har hats have to be approved by NCZ uh, 89. Is anybody in here required to wear a hard hat on their job? So. 
They, so, I mean, the suspension system always uh, amazes me when I look at a hard hat. I've never had to do it, and I try to put hard hats on, but I just don't know how I could ever make that feel comfortable and secure enough by <laughs> taking a look at, at, at the hard hat. So here's another picture. There's four, peop there's four people in the picture, and three of them are wearing hard hats. Anybody know who the person not wearing a hard hat is? And, and how many times we see this all the time when you're trying to get a good safety program in your organization that your supervisors are the ones that don't follow the rules and it really gets the employees a little bit of angst to see that their supervisor won't do what they do. So you're not going to have a good safety program if your supervisors aren't setting a, a good example. I had an, uh, I went to work on a lead plant in previous time. The project manager didn't want to use protection. We didn't. We used masks right. because of lead fuel cost. And then uh, a special, and the guy, when he went back to the office, he couldn't stop. We could hear <laughs> going up in the elevator because he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to use protection. protection. Okay, very good. Thank you. <clears throat> so wear and care for head protection. Again, you need to make sure that it fits properly. There is a suspension system we were talking about, and I was looking at one in the last month trying to figure it out. So I did figure the front to the back of the, of the hard hat. Uh, but you, you want to make sure that, if, that it's secure and it fits comfortably. So what's the trick to wearing a comfortable hard hat? You don't want it to be too tight. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, inspect before each use. So this is one of the reasons why you want to keep it clean. You want to be taking a look for damage. Is there any cracks in it? You want to take a look at the suspension uh, system and make sure there's not tear or, or wear in that. And uh, because if you do, it could reduce its ability to protect you. Um, Clean regularly, you want to clean it on a regular basis so that when you do do your inspection that you're able to see if there's any damage to it. And uh, use only to protect the head. So that's, the, that's what a hard hat is for. So how many times do you see people sitting on their hard hat or stepping on their hard hat? But the intended purpose is to protect you from impact uh, to the head. So if you stand on it, you could jeopardize the integrity of the hat and not be able to protect you. Uh, to the degree it's supposed to. Military helicopter pilots used to sit on them. That was to protect themselves from bullets. <laughs> <laughs> I guess whatever it takes, right? So on selecting uh, foot protection, steel toed shoes are really to protect you against rolling objects up on the foot. Uh, metal tarsal protection is to protect the bones of your feet. Uh, Again, that was another interesting thing. If the company supplies that bracket, and I guess you've all seen the little toes that you have for steel toed shoes, they don't have to pay for it. But uh, So if you want to wear metal, ta torso, metal tarsal protection, if they supply you with that uh, protective shield, then the company won't pay for that. Uh, well, Barney? Right, absolutely. Uh, some soles are a puncture. And, and slip resistant soles and you want to make sure that the soles are in good shape that there's not a lot of wear on them either for for puncturing from sharp objects or just from walking on slippery floor, floors. Uh, chemical resistance are there to are, are lined to protect you against any chemicals, acids or caustics that you may be spilled onto your shoes. Yes. Insulated boots would be for electrical workers. Uh, so waterproof and cold, cold weather uh, footwear, uh, you want to make sure that if you're working in muddy, wet, uh, cold environments that you have that protection. And probably one of the most confusing things when we're taking a look at standards for me was that OSHA has taken a, OSHA has taken a look at, ANSI has always been the guiding light for shoe protection, but in the last couple of years, shoes are the, it's getting broader and broader and they stop really recording that. So ASTM has really come in and taken uh, that, that limelight away from them. The standard's pretty much the same, uh, but some articles I read say that the ASTM has taken over for ASNS. 
eye, but also I've read that they're com comfortable. So through consensus, that, that if they're marked with either one of those, they're still good uh, to be used as approved uh, footwear. So wear and care. So footwear should be comfortable. Uh, when you wear, it should be like your street shoes. There shouldn't be any everyday shoes that you wear. It shouldn't be uncomfortable because they're work boots. You should inspect before each use to make sure that, uh, that there's no cracks to tear, especially if it's chemical. If you're wearing chemical boots or some type of electrical insulation boot, you don't want it to have any wear or tear on it. Uh, make sure there's not any holes uh, in, in your boots as well. Check the soles for excessive wear, again, for penetration or for slippery floors. And keep clean. So you should clean off any uh, kind of debris or hazardous material should be moved at the end of each day to keep your boots in good shape. So here is that what I was just talking about. In 2009, this is what OSHA put out. It's basically saying that either one is through consensus standards is acceptable to be used. Selecting hand protection. So there's so many different types of hand protection out there to protect uh, you against different hazards. Uh, chemical resistant uh, gloves are made of so many different materials, but the manufacturer will uh, tell you the degradation of that and the life expectancy of the glove and uh, the permutation rate of the chemical glove is something you want to be aware of. Uh, Kevlar and metal mesh as to protect you against uh, uh, cuts and punctures is why you wear those. Leather gloves, you would, you would be wearing leather gloves to protect you against cuts and scrapes. Uh, extreme cold or hot temperature gloves are out there uh, to be used. Uh, mostly for cold, it's just a glove with a lining, a special glove with a lining. But heat could be a different material to protect you uh, from that hazard. And then electrical work gloves. Interesting, I didn't know this until I started looking at it, are black rubber with a red uh, lining inside so that when you do check for uh, the wear and tear of it, if you see any red coming through, you know you have cracks in, into, the, into the glove. Okay. And the challenge sometimes is that you end up needing multiple, you have multiple hazards. Sometimes you have to wear different, like layers. Well, like yeah. you have, may have a glove underneath for one thing and an over glove for something else. Okay. And then, and then you ask them to, to go and, and put something on their little tablet, right? And they're just the right when you have bulky gloves. <laughs> So we, go, we come to wear and, uh, and care of your gloves, so it should fit comfortably. You want to make sure the glove isn't so tight that it restricts your movement. You want to make sure it's not too loose, that it gets snagged on something, or it just can't use to grab something the way you, you need to to handle it. Uh, inspect before each use. Again, we talked about why for chemical, why for electric, that you want to check your, your gloves. And uh, discard if damaged. So if you see wear and tear, holes in gloves, uh, you need or contaminate it you need to go ahead and dispose of those gloves and get new gloves. So last one, selecting general work clothing here. So you'd have uh, long sleeve shirts and long sleeve pants. We talked about if you're required to do it, it could be in a cold environment. It could be you're working around equipment that could give you abrasions, tears to your arms, your legs, or your torso. Uh, you want to use flor uh, flame retardant uh, resistance for welders or grinders who would be exposed to sparks. Uh, no loose clothing or jewelry uh, would be used uh, for uh, around moving equipment because you don't want to get pulled into the equipment. It would snag your, your chain or your uh, clothing. And then, then chemical resistant clothing, there's different protections for different hazards that are out there in the field. So kind of wrapping it up here, uh, taking a look at, can we match it now? Basically, after going through this, can we match up? So shaded filter lenses go on the left side, go with what on the right? No, it's not going to work. You're correct, though. OK. How about bump caps? Correct. Steel toe shoes. OK. Flame retardant clothing. And then chemical re resistant gloves. Yeah. And last but not least, these are the key points to remember. Uh, 
uh, we went through that each job function, each department needs to be assessed for hazards. Every part of the body is taken into consideration during assessments. And PPEs selected in response to the specific hazard. And finally, proper wear and care of PPEs is necessary to provide effective uh, protection. But now it works. All right, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, very informative, as a uh, token of our appreciation. Very good, thank you. There you go. <laughs> now, we're running, we're running a bit over time. Uh, there are a okay, do we have a couple of questions? Yes. I don't I don't have any input on that. <laughs> within the National Safety Council? <laughs> Okay.
got time for one more question. I would think it. Yeah. Go. I would say, go to OSHA.gov. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this recorded presentation given at one of the Atlanta Metro Chapter meetings of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. To find out more about us or to join us, check us out at gspe.org.